Well, good evening, and welcome to the Beaverton Religion Forum. Uh, we have uh, three presenters tonight. Uh, we have Nathan Lewis, who is the uh, minister at this church here, Evergreen Presbyterian. We have Ramesh, and I'm sorry I've forgotten your last name, Ramesh. It's a long one, Krishna oh. Wolfi. <laughs> Krishna Wolfi. Yeah. Am I anywhere near close? You're close. That's okay. Good. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll stop there. And we have um, Bernie Daler. Uh, Ramesh is going to present a Hindu perspective and Bernie an atheist perspective, is that correct? Mm -hmm. And uh, my name is Charlie Meeker, and full disclosure, I'm a member of this congregation here, so uh, it is, it is my attempt, going to be my attempt to moderate this, and in, in moderating it, I'm going to try to do as good a job moderating as Bernie did, uh, has done in, in the past when he moderates, and, and I will say this, that Bernie has done an excellent job as a moderator, and I think anyone, whether the presenter was a Christian or a non-Christian, they would say that Bernie did an excellent job at that. So I, I have a, Bernie's a tough act to follow, and, but I got drafted. So uh, our format tonight, we're going to have uh, from each of these three men, you have the format printed here, each of these three men is going to have some time to present uh, on the topic of how can we do good for our community and the world from the perspective of each of these uh, philosophical or religious points of view. And we'll start by having each of them basically give a three-minute presentation going through, and I'm going to do this alphabetically, which I think I think that means atheist before Hindu. But no, atheist, Christian, then Hindu. <laughs> you got to swap places and I <laughs> That's okay. Atheist, Christian, then Hindu. Does that sound reasonable? Okay. And so the, the first three minutes will be uh, they're presenting how uh, their particular philosophy is good for the world. And then uh, after we've gone through one round of three minutes, then each of them will have an opportunity to, to respond to that uh, first sets of three minutes. And then finally there will be a third round uh, to, for them to tie up the loose, the loose ends. At that point in time we're going to take a break because Bernie hasn't yet taught Chad how to change the tape on the... Chad, you need to get home and get your dad to teach you that so he doesn't have to do it. So you, we're going to cha change the tape. And then we will have the audience participation point of view, and we'll explain a little bit more how that, how that works when that time comes. And now we have our, the real ruler here is this guy here, and I will give you guys each three minutes. So anything else? Do I need to, if I said everything I need to say? I think so. That's good. Okay, go ahead, Bernie. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay, just to tell you a brief overview, I, I come from a belief system that could be called secular humanism, which is naturalistic. And the reason why it's naturalistic is because there's no good evidence for anything supernatural. And basically, a foundation of my belief system is logic and reason. So I want you to hold, that, hold me to that during this discussion. Next. Okay, so... Uh, one thing I want to talk about is motivation. I don't believe in anything supernatural. So for a Christian, they believe after they die, there's a supernatural places like heaven and hell. And what you do is going to determine your destiny there. Um, and for a Hindu, for example, and other religions, they believe reincarnation and karma. So what you do now is going to affect your karma. So for those, I don't have, those, those have zero impact on me whatsoever. So then, you know, as I reflect, what would make me, what does make me want to do good works? And I, when I reflect on that, I think it's largely I want to have a positive self-image. I want to feel good about myself. And th that could be broken down to two things, reputation and my legacy. So reputation, I want my kids to be proud of me. I want my wife to be proud of me. Um, you know, my coworkers, my friends, and all that. Um, and then as far as a legacy, you know, um, I'm going to have, you know, I have grandkids and things like that. I, I want them to know what their grandpa was like and, you know, not some bad guy. So these are the reasons why I, I do good things. So next screen. Um, so what do I do? Okay, so uh, most of my work is basically reaching out and helping people and <coughs> teaching people about a naturalistic worldview. And this spends a lot of my time, I spend a lot of my free time doing this. Um, for example, I founded the Center for Philosophical Naturalism for the purpose of promoting naturalism. So for people who leave religion and, and leave supernatural thinking, what you might call magical thinking, 
how do you live your life now? And this is why one thing I'm doing is helping people try to recover in that. Uh, one of the movements lately that's getting a lot of press is called Sunday Assembly, which is so-called God- Godless Congregation. And I'm one of the leaders of that uh, in the Portland area. Next one. And then some other things I do, too, um, is a little bit to help other people just more directly as I have a prison ministry where I, there's a humanist in the prison who's a leader there, and I help mentor him, and also uh, we're friends. Um, when I was a Christian, uh, I was involved in Compassion uh, International and also World Vision, and I still do that. There's a woman I'm helping through college in the Philippines, for example. And then Kiva is another good um, charity that I like. Next page. So in summary, I would just like to say that this is the one life we have. This is the time for justice and doing good works, and that's my whole motivation. So we'll leave it there. You can go back to the first page. That is, you were one second short. Okay. Very good. Can I get one more second? <laughs> All right. Nathan, your, your shot. Chuck, timing us up as a good work, Bernie. All right. So um, the um, Christian church is undeniably the longest standing and largest philanthropic collective in human history. But that is not in any way uh, the unique point about Christianity when it comes to answering the question, uh, what what does our system offer that is good for the world? Uh, The the real point is that uh, since its inception, the Christian uh, religious system has joined with neighbors and governments to care for the needs of the world. So it's Christianity working alongside of many other religion systems. Uh, For example, every year Forbes magazine puts out the top 50 uh, uh, charities, American charities list. In 2013, seven of the top 11 uh, are Christian organizations or founded by Christians. But if you look into the details of those organizations, they are a collaboration between Christians and non-Christians reaching out to neighbors and throughout the world. Uh, Another example are are the uh, hospitals throughout the world. Uh, The oldest oldest hospital in the world was founded by a Chinese Buddhist monk who traveled to India to open a hospital. And so the first hospital was established uh, clearly by an atheist. Uh, Buddhism is an atheistic religious system. Uh, The first Christian hospitals uh, were founded out of the first uh, Council of Nicaea in 325 AD uh, when the council, all the ministers of the churches in the Mediterranean area there, determined to establish a hospital with every cathedral uh, in Christendom. And so that is why there's so many Christian hospitals in the world to this day. Uh, But only uh, 13% of American hospitals uh, today are founded by Christian uh, churches. So there's only 604 hospitals out of 4,573 hospitals that are Christian in establishment and mission. And one of the reasons for that is that Christians have always stepped out of their own Christian organizations to collaborate with governments and other groups of people to help neighbors. Got about Uh, 15 seconds now. Oh, well, I'll I'll have to go on. I'll have more examples for you. But the, the greatest contribution of Christianity is the gospel of Jesus Christ, which moves Christians to repent of their sins. It's, it's no, it's no uh, secret that Christians have done a lot of bad in this world, a lot of wrong. And the gospel tells us to repent of that wrong and to openly do so and to move in a direction uh, seeking forgiveness and restoration and to do the good. That's the big contribution of good that Christianity has given to us. Okay. Ramesh. Gosh, three minutes. Okay. Um, so Hinduism, or the way it's really called as Sanatana Dharma, is a very individualistic or a personal way of life. And it's more of a grassroots kind of an activity. 
And if we can follow a couple of tenets that I will talk about in a minute, that grassroots kind of activity or influence we can have, whether it's in our community, in our city, or even in the world, is what will help us live in a better world. I want to talk about two tenets that are inherent in the Hinduism. The first one is what is called as the dharma of every individual. Dharma is nothing but a way or a set of intrinsic or natural responsibilities, duties or action that come in that particular state. That dharma can be based on your position in your family, could be at a position at a stage in your life, could be in terms of what your responsibilities are towards your environment. The second one is what we call as how do you execute on those of the dharma ten. And the two principles on which Hinduism is based can be summarized into two words. The first one is what we call as serve. The second one is what we call as share. Now, what, how we serve, what we serve, whom we serve, what are the mechanisms to serve, are all in details depending on a context, depending on a situation, depending on a given specific uh, individual <coughs> example. And share also is about, it's not just sharing material wealth or material things that are around you. There are a variety of ways in which you can share. And the one principle that our scriptures teach us to do this or to justify this is a way of equality. Our scriptures tell us to see yourself in everyone around you and to see everyone around you in yourself. It's a way of saying there is something more common to all of us or everything that's around us beyond the physical shape, form, name and qualities in us. If you can look beyond that and understand that common entity across us, it will be so easy for us to share, it will be so easy for us to serve, it will be so easy for us to have a good influence on the society. Now I call it a grassroots movement because the more you think about what good will you be able to do to others <coughs> around you, it builds on itself so that ultimately there is a better uh, environment, a better world, and a better way for all of us to live together. Thank you, Ramesh. Okay, now we're coming to the second part where each of these men have an opportunity to uh, finish up what they were saying or respond <laughs> in some way to uh, what some of the, what one of the other ones said. So, and we'll go uh, in the same order, same alphabetical order. Bernie. Yeah, so I think it was supposed to be like three minutes to address the other people what they said. Okay. So, okay. Go ahead, Bernie. Okay, uh, one thing I wanted to ask Pastor Nathan, um, it sounds like you're saying the ultimate good work might be sharing the gospel of forgiveness. So I was thinking, you know, for a thought experiment, one of the worst people ever was like Adolf Hitler, for example. So just as a thought of experiment, would you, if you had the opportunity, would you preach the gospel to him in the hopes that he would be saved and go to heaven? Are we interacting here? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, what I, what I was trying to say concisely is that uh, Christianity is truly good for the world by calling its adherents, its Christian members, to the gospel of repentance. Forgiveness is something that flows out of repentance. And repentance teaches, uh, we, we believe that's a gift that God gives to us, that we can turn away from the wrongs that we have committed. And that is good in itself. And repentance has two parts, turning away from the wrong and turning to the good. And, and this is a unique uh, part of, of uh, this is a unique Christian contribution in the world of religion and in the world of communities mm -hmm. to have this repentance. Mm -hmm. That's that's what I, I was trying to say right. would be a unique contribution. Right, so I'm trying to, to, to say the thought experiment, if you had the opportunity, would you, for example, go to Hitler and, and try to lead him to repentance so he could you know, be well, saved and go to heaven? Well, my point is, is that all those who claim to be united to Christ would be uh, truly seeking to repent in our own lives. I wasn't saying that we would use that 
as a message that we would necessarily give to other people. I was just talking about what each and every Christian is called to do, and that is to exercise repentance. So now you want me to think about someone else out there like Hitler. Mm -hmm. My point was, I'm called by, <coughs> by my God to repent of my own sins. And that's a unique contribution that I have uh, for the good of the world. Okay, do we have more time? Yeah, we've got about another minute there, Bernie. Okay. Um, I was going to ask for a question, but I, I think I forgot what it was. Um, well, just the, 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 okay, so back to you, Nathan, since we were talking about this. Um, so I, I think part of the message of forgiveness is giving the gospel out, and everybody should have the gospel if it's a good thing. And so the reason why I'm asking about Hitler is because sometimes the extreme cases are a good way to, to test the theory to see if it, you know, if, if you say this is the way it is, okay, what about this extreme case? Does it work? So I'm just wondering if you would reach out to everybody in love with the gospel message, including Hitler, and, and honestly hope that Hitler would go to heaven. I'm just wondering if that's consistent with your belief system. I think what most Christians would agree on with me is that uh, in our family relationships, with our neighbors, with the more common relationships that we find ourselves in, all fraught by sin, selfishness, mistakes, if we take the path of repentance and forgive each other and restore toward good, toward common good, then that is, that's, that's how we deal with the Hitler problem. So Hitler came out of a community, and that community uh, bears some of the responsibility for Hitler, and we, we all do together. Okay. So since I'm actually, you, you used up some of, I'm going to, it's your turn now, Nathan. So you've got uh, about two and a half minutes left to interact with what Ramesh and Bernie have shared. Oh, well, I, I think right now most of my reactions are against the timekeeping because I'm, I'm like a type B kind of a person. But that's all right. So now I'm using up even more time. But I'm really pleased to... Uh, to sit on, in, on the panel with, for the first time, um, a, a knowledgeable and devoted uh, Hindu uh, like Ramesh, and was able to have uh, lunch with him and Bernie this past week. And uh, I'm just curious, uh, Ramesh, of, to, to give you my remaining seconds, uh, to tell us uh, a little bit more about uh, the sharing, the, the second part. I heard you talk about service. Mm -hmm. That sounds like there's a lot of correlation. Mm -hmm. But your sharing seemed to be rooted in this Hindu um, idea of oneness. Mm -hmm. And so in the West, as you know, in, in younger religious systems, we, we tend to emphasize distinction. Mm -hmm. So just tell us a little bit more about how that principle of oneness mm -hmm. uh, really helps us out. Sure, yeah. Um, I'll try and attempt, but he's too <laughs> kind with his words, so you let to excuse him. So, um, Yeah, the shading part of it is a pretty uh, deep and involved topic. Um, a simple way to understand that is, um, if you look at anything that we see around us, right, they all have some level of dependency on each other. For example, we ate a pizza, right? And we never questioned who made the pizza. We never questioned where the corn and those things were grown. But we accepted it at this level to say, there is food here. There is a level of thanks that we give to someone whose time or effort or even their sweat and blood went into giving us that part. So this oneness concept is very something very similar to that. Everything and everyone around us is a part of a singular unity. What that entity is, is something that we may not be able to describe. We may not be able to prove it in some picture form or in a mathematical formula or anything. If we can understand that everything that we have, we see, we touch, we interact, and we get involved in 
is something that everyone else has an influence or everyone else has a right to. That is the concept of sharing that our um, scriptures promote. So it's not about um, the communistic principle or the socialistic principle that nobody owns anything. It's not that. It's more about understanding that we are all in such an entangled web that we all are influencing each other's actions. It may not be uh, me to uh, my 94-year-old friend or someone who's living in Australia, but at some level, there is that interaction. At some level, there is that dependence. At some level, there is that shape. Mm -hmm. That is what is the concept that I tried to tell you during yeah, our lunch. Thank you. I hope that was very nice. Question. Okay, now Ramesh, it's your turn. Uh, but before I uh, ask either of them, uh, let me respond to a question that uh, Bernie brought up in terms of repentance and how it relates to <coughs> person like Christian. And I'll try and give you my response from the Hindu perspective. Uh, one of the things that we learn from our scriptures and our own uh, teachings is that um, whatever you do in uh, in terms of a repentance or in terms of forgiveness or even in terms of recognizing a mistake that happened and going forward. In our scriptures it tells that you don't do it for a purpose. You don't do it for gaining something. Whether there's a heaven or not, whether there's a hell or not is a different topic but that forgiveness or that repentance should be for you to understand, hey, I need to change my way, I need to change my actions, I need to change my thinking for the betterment. And our scriptures also tell us what happens in the future, what happens as an effect of that is not in your control. Do what is right for you today and things will turn out definitely better than what you would have done if you hadn't repented, if you hadn't done the same thing over again. Just a way to respond to what was Bernie's question. I give the rest of my time. You give up the rest of your time. <laughs> okay. So, now we come to a, the third part. And I'm fiddling, as you can tell, I'm fiddling with my <coughs> electronic device here, trying to figure out which is the best way to, uh, to do all these things. So, now is the time for each speaker to get three minutes to reply to all previous presenters and summarize their thoughts. Just another round of what we just did, yeah. Okay. Well, go ahead, Bernie, your uh, turn. Okay, yeah, this time I'll have a question for uh, Ramesh. Um, a thought experiment for you about karma, for example. Mm -hmm. Let's say, for example, uh, we take two cases. Um, these two children are born in different places, okay? One is, one is born into a very wealthy family. And as soon as they're born, of course, they're taken home into a life of luxury. Another one is born into a life of poverty, and not only that, but is born with an illness and dies that same day it's born. So would you say the reasons for those two different births were from previous lives, from Carmen? Yeah, I think I'll try and expand on the answer I gave you the other day. Uh, the karma theory doesn't specifically uh, pertain to a specific person at all times. Uh, for example, uh, if you understand this as a collective consciousness or a collective entity, uh, it's not specifically what I did that I will get as a result of that karma. It may not be at this time, it may not be in this place, it may not even be in this world. So the karma theory is not very specifically about this boy was born in a wealthy family because he specifically did something in his previous birth. It's almost like saying, I could be doing something today and the effects of that action will probably affect, could be someone else, could be at some other time to me or someone else, could be at a different place to me or someone else or at a different time. So, so just to interrupt you, so you're saying those two cases and there's no there's no specific reason why they were, you can't say there's a specific reason why they were born in two different states? Yes. I mean, for me, I would just say it's just random. You don't have any control, but 
you're saying that it could be karma, it could not be karma, it may be a mix, that there's other things? That That's true. So if you look at it over, let's say, a passage of time or in a community, the more good things that people are doing within a community, you will see that the whole community as a whole has a betterment in its own existence. Right? That's the, to give you that understanding or to give you that level of uh, education, we can look at specific examples saying, because I cheated someone out of $50 two years back, I'm being cheated out of $200 today. <coughs> Those can be specific uh, instrumental <coughs> examples. They, it, it doesn't mean that it's not going to happen to me. For example, if I smoke up today, my brain is the one that's going to get fried. It's not someone else's brain. Right? So, uh, I'm, all I'm saying is, you need to elevate that cause-effect uh, relationship to beyond just that individual person. There are effects that will happen to that individual, there are effects that can happen to other individuals. For example, if I go detonate a bomb somewhere, not that I'm going to do it, by the way. It's not right. going to affect me, but it's going to affect others. Mm -hmm. So the karmic theory is a lot more involved than just saying it's a bank account where for the good things that I do, I get good things. For the bad things I do, I get bad things. Now it's Nathan's turn, your final three minutes. To ask questions? Ask questions or respond to what's heard before or to summarize what you've done, what you've said. Well, I, I, I'm interested to know, uh, Bernie, what you think about my, my point that, um, that Christian charity has been well established and successful for a long time because of our collaboration with other groups of people. Yeah. Uh, because I think it, in most Christian atheist debates of late, Christians brag about everything that we've done good in the world. And then atheists come back and say, well, that's because you're a long-standing religion and we're just getting going. Well, there's been atheists since, you know, the dawn of time. Yeah, you know. But, okay. you know, how do you... So my point is to be honest about that. For, you know, the, the oldest Muslim hospital operating in the world was founded in 707 A.D., in Damascus, Syria, and it was co-founded by Christians and Muslims working together. And I would contend that that is the collaboration. I mean, the hospital's good, but sticking credit to one religious system is not necessarily the good, but the collaboration. I, I think uh, Christians do really way extraordinary good works, but part of that might be because, in a way, you're forced to do it because... <coughs> Um, you know, there's heaven to gain and hell to be paid for if you don't do it. So it's kind of like if you have a, a knife to somebody's back and say, you do good works or I'll kill you, and they do a lot of good works, you can say, like, wow, look at all the good works that guy's doing. But it's like, he's got a knife there, so what's the motivation? You know, is the motivation doing it because you feel like you have to out of an obligation? Or is it, and, and you know, being a former evangelical Christian, I know what it's like to feel like, you know, you sacrifice your life for God. Like any missionary in here, they sacrifice their life for God. That's because that's what you feel like God demands of you, not because you just really want to do it. I mean, if there's no God, then of course you wouldn't do that. So I, I have concerns about, yeah, it's extraordinary giving, sacrificial giving, but I think the motive really, it, it taints it in a way because it's not really from the heart or because they really want to. And so what about the collaboration? What about that kind yeah. of idea? I think all the groups have collaborated, and, and um, I, yeah, I think Christians... They're noteworthy for, like I said, I think they actually do, I mean, they, they do a lot more good works that atheists can't compete with because they're willing to sacrifice their life for that next life. And, you know, they're, they're sacrificing things for the eternal life, for the next life, and we don't have that as an atheist. So that's not a motivator for us whatsoever. So th there's a difference there. But you could, I mean, you could sacrifice for your legacy, <laughs> and what was the other one? So yeah. Reputation. Couldn't you make the same level right. degree of sacrifice for reputation and legacy so that 50 years from now oh your phone is the one making that's it. right yeah. I was thinking it was one of my students right. out here no, no. playing some video game it's you it's me oh anyway so now it's Ramesh's turn okay <laughs> 
Uh, nice to go last so that I don't get challenged here that much. Um, so let me spend about a minute on some of the uh, comments that uh, Bernie made, uh, which rings so well with what we believe in our own uh, tradition. Uh, the things about the being natural, what is logical, what's rational, is the basis of most of our uh, Hindu principles or Hindu tattva. This is what, we have a word for that in Sanskrit which I may not be able to translate or explain well, called dharma. That is the whole principle of dharma. It's all about, it's not something that can be challenged and you can challenge it but you will ultimately come back and say, Yes, I understand because of the principles on which it's founded. Things like, if you are a parent, there are some responsibilities and duties that come with that. Um, there is no question that, should I do it or should I not do it? Should I get a babysitter to do it or should I do it? Right? That's one, that's one very common theme that I can relate to with what Bhatmi was talking about. And the other thing that he talked about in terms of either reputation or feel good about it, if you think about it at a certain level, that itself is heaven. That itself is a state of mind where you feel like you are in heaven. And I, I tell a lot of my high school students that the best position for you to be in is not to have a heavy worry sitting on your mind saying, I cheated in my exam, I don't know when I'm going to get caught. I don't know when I'm going to get into trouble. Rather than being honest about it and say, I've done my best, I have nothing to worry about. That itself could be a state of being in heaven. And the legacy part or the reincarnation part or the after death part is probably what he's talking about, which is the reputation that will live on after me. It's the name that I'll make for myself, my family, my progeny. That itself could be a way you can understand what is reincarnation about. What were the effects of the karma that I did today or the actions that I did today that are coming back to me later. And for what um, uh, Pastor, Pastor Nathan talked about, I want to relate to two things. Uh, the serving of the community is something of a common theme within the Hindu society. Going back to about 5,000 years when we have some understanding of what this society is to look like and how this, it was all about being able to serve and being able to share. It was almost like a community would uh, cook together, would share together what one person could do, the other one would take that responsibility. There would be a class of people who would pray for the rest of them so that they could go to the fields. What? They didn't have to take time to pray. So that service and that share mentality has been a cornerstone of the Hindu principle for one. Okay. Where did I go? You right ended. You were right on. That thing? Yeah, that was the thing. That was great. Okay, so uh, we've now finished the the first part, the uh, first round here, uh, where each of the panelists have had a chance to talk and interact with each other. Uh, we're going to take a short break now. Well. Bernie changes the tape, and then we're going to have the chance for the audience. You might be thinking of some questions that you might be willing to ask. So, short break. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're about ready to start here. So let me take a few minutes and explain just exactly how this is going to work. So uh, those of you that have been at, at uh, previous forums, um, I need to pay a special attention because this is significantly different than, than in the past. So let me first explain what the, some of the things that are uh, going to be the same. One of the things that's going to be the same is that each person, you have one chance, and then until everybody else gets a chance, you don't get another chance. Uh, the second rule is going to be uh, that children get preference to adults. So are you listening, David? Are you listening, Chad? Are you listening, Stephen? So you guys, you guys raise your hand. You go, you'll, go, you'll go straight to the front of the line. Man, the, the, so those are some of the things that are similar. Now, one of the things that's different is we, we really want to make this uh, audience-driven. So what we're going to do different this time is uh, you'll get a chance to, each of you, basically you have, a, uh, if I call on you, that means you've got three minutes to be in the driver's seat. 
Uh, if you want to stand up and give a monologue for three minutes, uh, that's your prerogative. Probably the rest of the people in the audience won't be as interested in it as if you choose some other way to use your three minutes. So, for example, you can ask a question of one or all three of the panelists, and they can respond. Uh, but if during that three-minute slot time that you have, uh, so for example, if you were to ask Bernie, can you please tell me about, uh, can you please tell me about um, how you, uh, your, how you, how you became a Christian? And instead of telling, asking about how you became a Christian, he talks about how he became an atheist. You could stop and say, wait a minute here, you're you're not answering my question. So you, you're in control there. Uh, I think both stories are interesting, but, but it's entirely, what's really important is what's interesting to you. So, uh, so you can, you can enter, so you can, each of you, when you're called on, you kind of have a, uh, up to three minutes that you can interchange with any or all of the panelists. Does that sound like a good way to work? Yeah, that? yeah, and hopefully the attitude for the people on the panel here is, you know, if you ask a question, we don't want to say, oh, this is it, and if you interrupt us, we're going to say, no, 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 let me finish what I'm saying. It's, it's not, we don't want to say, no, 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 let us finish. We want to defer to you so we could interact with your brain. So, you know, we, we don't want to talk about something you're not interested in. So we want to make sure you're, that we're hitting the thoughts that you want us to hit. So if we're off track, feel free to interrupt us. That's, and I want us to have the attitude that we're willing to stop and say, okay, sorry, I, you know, let me try to rephrase what I'm telling you. All right. So, um, and I'm going to... Do this. So, hands please. Who would like to go first? Okay, John. Um, so, with the Hitler example and how Christians have not been set back by God, that isn't quite true because God has a plan for each and every Christian that we should all, we should be willing to do what God calls us to do. But not everybody is a missionary. Like, Mr. Thomas was a missionary, but I know that he loved that and he was glad that he was a missionary. And I'm sure he'll tell you that if you asked him. And so, with each Christian, um, God's plan for you is different, and you don't do good works because that's what God wants you to do. But the Bible verse says that um, faith produces good works, and so through faith, people do good things. So, what, would you respond to that? Bernie, is that for me? Okay. Um, there's, um, yeah, there's, you know, there's some parables about Jesus, for example, uh, said, you know. I gave each one a talent or two, and then the person who got the biggest, uh, you know, return is the one who was praised and said, you know, well done, good and faithful servant. So it shows you that God expects something out of you, right? And so in, in the Christian culture, it's very common that, you know, you say, I want to hear that phrase from God, well done, good and faithful servant. And if you really take that seriously, what are you going to do? You're going to give, you're going to devote your life. You're going to go to the mission field. You know, you're going to, you're going to go all out if you really want to be a strong Christian. This, this, this is my, my uh, you know, so you can say, yeah, of course the love of God also compelled me, but of course if there's no God, I'm not going to be doing any of this stuff. So I'm doing all of this stuff really for heaven and hell and God and all that, because it's all intertwined with the afterlife. So that's, that's what I meant by my example that, you know, it's like, if, if you have a, a knife to somebody's back and say, go do these good works, and somebody can see all the good works that person's doing and saying, wow, what a great person, but it's like, is it really a great person because they're doing it because they feel like they have to do it? Yeah, but the difference is there is a God. But, okay, next thing. I have, I have lots of things to say. Um, so what you said, you're, you're compelled to do good works because of your uh, legacy or your reputation or whatever. But say you don't have any kids, no grandchildren, whatever. And you're fine with having a mediocre uh, legacy or whatever. What, what then compels you to do good works? Because with Pastor Nathan, and I'm sure the Hinduism, but I'm not super familiar with that, but I'm sure that both of them have reasons to do it based on their Bible or their spiritual book or whatever. Because, uh, like with the um, the fruits of the spirit, it's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. And all those things, I think we would agree, can lead to good works, and they can they're good things for the world. So, how does being an atheist help you be, do good for the world? Because you can be an atheist like you are and work at whatever you do at the prisons and do this type of stuff, but there's other atheists that may not care about this type of stuff. Right, so I would just say that if you're an atheist and you want to have a good life, the best life you can have, you know, you're going to be a good person. If, even if you don't have any kids, you're going to have friends. We're very social animals, and all your social connections are going to be 
hurt or destroyed if you're not a good person. You know, the, the worse you are, the worse you're going to be disconnected and, you know, it's going to end up in a bad self-image and self-destruction and everything else. There's okay. all the other consequences there. We'll go to the next question. All right, right here. And I've, you're Chad's brother, but I can't remember your name. I think that's my neighbor. Oh, neighbor. What's your name? Patrick. Patrick. Okay, Patrick. Who are you going to ask a question of, Patrick? Uh, hey. Okay. Um, so, uh, what, how, why do you believe in reincarnation? Did, like, some, did, like, did, like, your God that you believe in, like, just tell the first Hindu that they're reincarnation? Okay, so I'll try and frame an answer the way you can understand, okay? So, reincarnation doesn't mean changing bodies. It's not going from one body to another to another. Can you understand that part? Uh, yeah, well, but I mean, like, when did you, when, who, like, why did Hindus start believing me? Believing in reincarnation. So, okay. so, I mean, so Pat, Pat, oh. your question isn't isn't what does reincarnation mean, but how did Hindus learn about reincarnation? Yeah. Is that what okay. you're saying? Okay. okay. So the concept of reincarnation, the way we understand that is, life in this world is always a continuous process, right? There are always going to be beings born. There are always beings that are going to be dying, right? So because there is a constant renewal of these lives on this world, it is possible that a life form today will be another life form tomorrow or will be in another life form sometime after this current life is over. Right? Yeah, but it won't be you. It may not be me. It may not be me. It may be me. I'm not saying it will be me or I'm not saying it will not be me. But there is a very chance that it may be another... I may be another girl born in Africa for a poorer parent. It's possible. That is the concept of reincarnation that we believe in. Okay. Is that good, Patrick? Okay. Patrick left a minute on the table. Good job. So, another question. Somebody, adults can ask too. I don't want to say adults can't ask. But so far, it's... All right. Tara. Ramesh. Ramesh and for Bernie. I don't know. Is it okay to ask the question? That's fine. Yeah. Fine? You can ask the same question to both of them? Or yes, different questions? Right. No, same question. Okay. So if I go to my Christian hospital, um, on the wall are posters, um, I, I suppose, proclaiming what they believe are their ideals of what is good. So um, all people are created in God's image, mm -hmm. therefore, we're going to treat you like an image bearer of God. That's one of the posters. And then there are others. We won't go through them all. But when I see their posters, I know what their ideal of what is good is. So I know what a, what a Christian, as a, I mean, as a Christian, I, I would expect a certain kind of good. But when I go and see their posters, that is, in fact, what they're saying is, is good. That's their definition of goodness. So if I were to go to, like, a Hindu hospital, mm -hmm. What would be your definition of what is good? And if I were to go to an atheist hospital, what would be your definition of what is good? So you're asking for what would what would be the poster that would be hung up on a hospital that would reflect the yeah. the worldview that caused them to build the hospital? Right. Want me to go first? Yeah, go ahead. So if I were to build a Hindu hospital and if I had to put up the poster, I would put up the same poster that you saw in the Christian hospital that we are all reflections of God. In fact, I have a feeling that this statement was taken out of one of our scriptures. Exactly. It says the same thing. In fact, the example given in a scripture that I'm currently uh, studying with my group says, there's only one sun in the sky, but if you put out about 20 different parts of water, whatever would be the shape, size, and form of those parts, you will see the same reflection of the sun in them. So, the basic guiding principle in Hinduism is exactly the same. So, I wouldn't put up another uh, poster there in the, in the hospital. If I were going to put up a poster about uh, what is good, I would base it on what we call as one of the pillars of Hinduism called Ahimsa. Ahimsa is about not hurting. Now, 
you can interpret that not hurting as anything that is not destructive in nature. Anything that is positive, anything that will help, anything that will build, anything that has a soothing, healing, uh, beneficial, better effect on someone around me is a good act. You better let Bernie have a chance to, to describe yeah, his I can, poster. I can give a real brief, uh, ATS aren't known for building hospitals, right? Um, you know, for an atheist, the, one of the biggest things is about exploring wonder and uh, science and, you know, not letting magical thinking and mythology hold you down. But if they were to build a hospital, I think it would be something along the lines of, uh, you know, we, are, we believe in compassion. Like I said earlier, we're social animals. This is the only life we have. Let's take care of each other. This is all we have, you know. And so, you know, if you're on Facebook and, and uh, you know, there's a lot of motivational things on Facebook, people put those memes out, so once in a while you can see something like that. So I think it would just come from everyday experiences of, you know, love each other because it's a good thing, not because God told you or because the heaven or hell or something. Okay, next question. How about right here, Isaiah? Okay, thank you. So my question is mostly for Pastor Nathan and for Bernie, but Ramesh, if you want to answer, you can't. It's just a short, simple, sweet question. Um, I guess, what is your reason, your ultimate drive to do good in the world, to, I guess, serve others, to love others, and to care for each other? So. Okay, well, like, Bernie, go first, and then Ramesh this time. Um, well, like I said, it's not, I think for atheists, it's not, they, they depend on your personality, too. I mean, for me, I, I can only speak for myself. My number one personality is, or my drive is seeking truth. And um, I, I want to help other people because I went through Christianity and, and I want to give other people a head start and they, they don't have to go through everything I went through. So my good work is showing people how to live without religion, without the supernatural beliefs and magical thinking. So for me, that motivates me. It, it's fun and it helps me too because it reinforces my beliefs as I learn more to teach others. So I'm not sure if that answered your yeah. question, but... Okay. Yeah. Ramesh? Okay. Well, I, actually, he asked the two of us. <laughs> yeah, I know. Oh. And said Ramesh could come in. Oh, I'm sorry. If you wanted to. Thank, thank you for great. Do you have an answer? Yeah, I do. Uh, I can steal your time too. Yeah. <laughs> um, so most of the um, faiths in the world, if you look at the core uh, reason for having such a faith or such a congregation movement, is in some ways to answer one simple question. What you asked me was, in your mind, a simple question, but it's not. It's about happiness. It's about what is happiness, how do I find that happiness, and how do I feel happy? And one of the ways in which we answer that question to ourselves is that happiness is really a state of our mind rather than a physical comfort or a physical pleasure. Now, to get to that state of mind where I feel a joy or where I feel a bliss is by certain actions that I do and I understand what those actions do. So in my mind and looking at a lot of examples that have happened in the past, doing good things gives you that joy, that fulfilling, that happiness in the mind. That's one reason why I believe in good deeds. That's one reason why I get involved in it. Okay. <coughs> yeah, well, I... I'm part of um, perhaps the most pervasive Christian answer to your question, and that is gratitude to God. If God has transformed my life from darkness to light, uh, from bondage to freedom. And because he has done that, I am eternally grateful. And so I do his holy commands. I become an instrument of his good in the world out of gratitude. All right. Well, we're ready for the next question. You said children. Good. Okay, we'll give we'll give Chad a chance here. Okay, I have a question for Ramesh. Okay, let's say that I'm um, I'm totally born in like I don't know like any place, and I'm in my previous life I've been a really bad person, mm -hmm. and then pretty much what you say like the next life, like I'm a poor person since I did like a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Would you like Would you like go and help them? Or would you say no because like they deserve it since they were bad in the previous life? Okay. Uh, uh, 
when I try to help someone who need that help, I will never question why they got into that situation or what is the reason or what it will happen to them in the next uh, cycle of life or whatever. I do it from my personal point of view. I do it because it's the right thing to do. I'll do it because it's the correct thing to do. It's in the right place, the right time, and I have the opportunity to do it. I will do it without wondering about is it going to do me good because I'm doing a good deed now or is it taking away something from what happened to that person. Okay, so I have a second question. Uh -huh. So let's say that, um, like, oh, I can't it. Um, okay, so, anyway, I really actually forgot. That's okay, Chad. If he has time, I'll just give him a little more writer to. Okay, go ahead. So, um, even if you think about how they got to that or what happens to them later, in our uh, way of looking at things, we say that it's not sequential. Something bad you did may not immediately happen now. It may all collect and it might happen sometime later. It might happen to someone. So just understanding that part should motivate you to be doing the good thing now, the right thing now, not worry about how and when this thing will turn out to be a, an impact. Okay, so I remember my question. Good. So let's say that you, like, we try Okay, my mind is right. What's going to happen to him in the next life if he keeps forgetting? <laughs> oh, he will get the most <laughs> awesome tablet ever. <laughs> Good. Right, so okay, you got about 50, you got about 45 seconds left there, Chad. So let's say that you, you die. So when you come back, mm -hmm. are you like a new person? Like you, you forgot like your total numbers, so that means like you, you're just gone. You don't have like a next life since you don't really remember it. My memories may be gone. Mm -hmm. My physical features may be gone. I might be born with new memories. I may be born with new physical characteristics. Like I said, I could even be a girl in my next. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But I don't worry about it today. Then wouldn't it be like, it would be a whole different person. It, it could be. It could yeah. be a totally different so life form. So it's not you. It may not even be me. So you wouldn't have like... You could possibly be in a different religion. You could could be. Okay. And you want to probably be able to know about like the other religions, so you probably won't be able to go. No, like what if you're born into a different religion and you don't and you do bad things? And it's not your fault because you do bad things. And you, like today, you want to be do good things so you can like just be like you know, like you just be like you're just out like. Well, your, your time's just about up here, Chad, but if, if Ramesh is... Five seconds. If, if Ramesh is, is a bad person in this life, he'll become a Christian in his next life. If he's a good person in his life, he'll become an atheist in the next life. <laughs> John. This question is for Bernie. How are you doing, Bernie? Good. Good. Um, you've given two self-deprecating comments about atheism. One, you said that we're not like Christians. Uh, we're not as motivated as they are to do good works because we're not thinking about the afterlife. And then you said, uh, we're not really known for building hospitals. So um, my question is, when do you think this motivation to do good works is going to kick in for atheists? Um, it's not that they're not motivated. I say the motivations are different. Um, like I said, when I was an evangelical Christian, uh, I believed in sacrificing my life. I mean, what is this life? It's nothing. This, this is a vapor. You're going to live forever in eternity. This, totally throw away this life. But if you're an atheist, it's like, wait a minute, this is the only life we have, you know? So this life is it. And there's, there is motivation as an atheist, it's just totally different. It's, as a Christian, you can totally throw away, about the, throw away this life, and that's totally logical with the Christian theology. It's like, this life is, in, in the grand scale of things, this is nothing. But so it's so, everything. Exactly, yeah. So, it's the only thing we have. So are you, let me ask a follow-up, are you more or less motivated to run across a battlefield and lay down your life uh, for your country, or are you more or less motivated to put yourself on the line as a police officer, or are you more or less motivated to do those kinds of things because uh, the, the idea of biological self-preservation or whatever you might want to call it 
Camille is more strong in your perspective than Nathan, who says, if I die today, I'll be in the presence of my God tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so definitely there's a huge different motivation. Like, if you go to war, I mean, you know, for a, for, for a Christian going, they, they could say, you know, for God and country, you know, and if I die on the battlefield, like, you, like I said, that's forever, it's okay, but an atheist could say, I'm going to war, but only if it's necessary. Like, you know, for example, if Hitler's trying to overrun everybody and says, I'm going to take your country from you, and it's a matter of existence, yeah, let's go to war. But, you know, if it's a matter of, hey, let's go to war to get some oil, it's like, wait a minute, let's think about what we're doing here. Is this really needed? You know, instead of just being blind and saying, oh, forgotten country, you know, kind of thing. So, it, it, there's a lot more calculation. Of this, the whole calculation about this, this life is it versus this life is nothing. In Christianity, this life is really nothing in, in the time scale, you know, compared to eternity. Does that answer your question there, John? I would, I would ask if I got any time left. I'd you like got uh, 30 seconds. I'd like Nathan to take 30 seconds to respond to what Well, I, I would just say that it's patently false uh, in dogma and experience in Christianity that this life is nothing. Um, that's why Christians have collaborated with other people groups throughout history to do good in this life. We say this life is the only life we have to do God's will in this context. So what you've said is patently false about Christianity. Okay, next person here. Uh, how about you, David? You go back to where you came from. Where did you come from? So you think about how you, how you came to be. You came from really nothing. The sperm and egg came together. Each one was half a human. One human. When you were born, you couldn't even talk. You couldn't even think, hardly. And you, know, you can't even remember what it's like to be a toddler. So you're, you, you basically emerged. And as you get older, if you live to a ripe old age, your brain will go down and you'll go back down to nothingness again. So it's, it's an awesome question, and when you really think about this question, you'll, you'll get into consciousness, what is consciousness, and this is one of the breakthroughs that people are working in science now to try to understand this. So that's a really good existentialist question, philosophy. Did that answer your question, David? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to try to call on somebody that I don't know, because most people I've called on have been people that I know. I see a hand there. I, I know you. That's Ellie Esau. That's Ellie Esau. I should know you. She's grown up. She's grown up. Ellie, go ahead and ask your question. Um, well, I have a bunch of things to say, but I'll try and get through a couple of them. Um, one thing, just to clear up what I think John was saying, was that we're saved through faith, not works. And so it's not like God is holding a knife to our back. It's that we believe that we have, um, when we have faith in Him, it produces the works. And we're not saved because of the works. And it's not like He's forcing us to do the works. It's that faith in him that makes us want to do that. And so I think he didn't quite exactly say that, so I was just saying that, if it makes any clear. But, um, and then I have a question for you, um, which is, what is your, or what do you think is the ultimate source of truth? Like you were saying that you think, you, you're striving to find um, truth, or the source of truth. So mm -hmm. what would you consider? Is that for me? Yeah, yeah. Okay, the one thing is, I, I understand what you're talking about, Grace, and I completely agree with you. There's like, you can look at both angles. And like I said, the parable of the servant, you know, well done, good and faithful servant, that parable there clearly teaches you that God expects works out of you, and the more works you do, the better afterlife you're going to have. That's the clear teaching of that. And of course, you can find other parables that teach what you just did. It's like, regardless of works. So there's both of them in the Bible. Um, as far as truth, the scientific method is so awesome in this way is that scientific, the scientific method gives us new uh, facts. And, and the great thing about science is you create a hypothesis and you test it, and you can independently test it. That way you know you're not just a delusion. And there's, there's also ways to make sure you have good measurements instead of you know, being subjective-like. Uh, so there's, way to get, there's ways to get subjectivity out of it. And then just in logic and reason, there's you know, like learning about critical thinking and what's a logical fallacy. A lot of people have logical fallacies to where they... They build up bad conclusions because they have faulty thinking. So logical fallacies, learning about those is a huge thing in, in your life to learn how to find truth. Okay, so, so truth is like science and reasoning is what? Science and reason will lead you to truth, yes. Okay, all right. I guess. Okay, right in front of Ellie. 
That's you. Uh, I guess this is for Bernie. Um, what would be sort of the representative answer uh, from secular humanism about art and music and where it comes from and why, why the artist is compelled to create and why the musician is compelled to make music, why the, why the dancer is compelled to dance? Yeah, there's a PSU philosophy professor named Joshua Faust. He gave a presentation on this once. Um, and I'm not sure if it's, he also wrote a book, I'm not sure if he talks about this, but uh, generally speaking, according to him, um, basically it's just, you know, it's just pleasurable. It's something we do for pleasure. The art and the creation process and we have these powerful brains and when we do those things, it, it brings us pleasure. That's why we do it. Can I um, ask if it's all right with, with you, since you're in the driver's seat, can we get a response oh, sure, from the other absolutely. two? Yes. Ramesh and Nathan? Sure. Uh, let me go to the Yeah. Um, so w one of the things that uh, we discuss in our own tradition, our culture, is that of the mind and its manifestations. Uh, actually, a partial answer to what was the previous question about what is truth, right? Um, not all truths can be proven scientifically. This is one of the beliefs that we have. And one way to get to that truth or whatever we understand as a truth on any given topic is introspection or is through internal um, thinking through or discussing that through within yourself to clarify your, your own thoughts to get to that, okay, now I understand this is the truth behind it. But to be able to do that, you need to have a clear, uh, controlled mind so that you can focus on the topic, you can really get to that level of clarity on that particular topic. And mind is a weird thing. It's always uh, going off in a hundred million different ways. And one way to really get to that control of the mind, so, someone was talking to me about meditation earlier, Meditation is one way in which you can calm the mind, you can control the mind, and you can focus the mind. The other ways to do that is to engage in focused activities like music, like art, or any other form of expression which takes an effort to focus the mind on a singular topic, to help clarify the mind on that topic, and then you can use those skills to think about who am I? What am I? Is this the right thing to do with this thing and so on? That is the role some of these art and other art forms plays in our culture. And Nathan, from your perspective, what is the source of art and music and what is it that motivates? The, the source is the very being and creativity of God. And so uh, the art <laughs> forms are some of the highest human expressions because we, we display the beauty of God and the beauty of God's uh, nature. And so, uh, if you think about it, all of our science technology is serving the arts. I'm a humanities guy, so yeah, I can talk that way about the sciences. But everything that Intel's given to us that we're using tonight is to put forth beautiful expressions and true expressions and good expressions. So science is a, is a tool that serves these higher forms because everything that humanity does is to reflect and to proclaim the goodness, the beauty, the truth, the existence of God. Okay, uh, next question here. Right here in the front, please. Thank you. I don't know exactly how to word this, but I'd like to pose it mostly to uh, Pastor Nathan. Um, going back to kind of a, the, somewhat of a motivation, and as a Christian, I'm hearing, a, I'm not a Christian, but as a Christian, I'm hearing a lot of, doing God's work, um, how does a Christian know what God's work is? What's the communication that he gets using the example, perhaps, of going to war? Right. So I don't know if uh, any Christians who would agree with Bernie that, you know, Bernie slightly suggested that Christians go to war for oil. Uh, uh, the United States of America and other groups of people that include Christians might. But how do we decide this? Christianity is a relinquishing of self-controlled life, relinquishing to a, a higher power, 
to a personal power, to one who loves us and guides and directs us, who has made us with meaning and purpose uh, to do a will that is greater than ourselves. So to be a Christian, I have to open up my hands and relinquish my will, my agenda, my control, and I have to say, I am here for a purpose beyond myself. And how do you get that communication? Well, it's not, it's not as power. easy as, th that's what why... Is, what is the, I mean, does it come in a dream? Is it in old biblical times? Or does it come in the lyrics of a song? Is it... Well, God's, I guess I'm looking for something a little more tangible, maybe? Well, yes, that's and that's, that's why God has given to us quite a, quite a few means, including all sorts of natural means. But you want something more tangible? That's why God has, in the fullness of time, spoken to us through the incarnate Son of God, Jesus in the flesh. That's why God has given to us uh, written documents of his interaction with real human beings throughout human history so that we can piece it together, so that we're just not left with, oh, I wonder what's going to happen. See, so every time we buck up against what God has given to us and say, oh, you really mean that these scriptures are holy and I'm supposed to follow those? But you don't sound to be in that camp. You sound to be quite open. You want to, you want to have something tangible. God's given to you 66 books written over 1,500 years in multiple cultures so that you can see how people have grappled with that, with your very longing and question. And better than that, in the fullness of human history, God sent his son to show us what it means to please God. Would Jesus have gone to Iraq? Well, your three, your, three, your three minutes is up. I'm okay, sorry. <laughs> well, I, I would sorry. say that, I, 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 I would say that most Christians that. in the world would say no, he would not have. But yes, he would have in many other ways for many other purposes. Okay, yeah. another question here. Uh, I'm going to go for Richard. Um, my question is about uh, the concept of radical moral failure. And uh, what does that mean? Well, I'm not sure. Uh, but my, uh, my guess is that the atheist doesn't really find that an interesting category. I mean, there are moral failures, you know, and what's the remedy for moral failures? I presume it's to figure out, well, why did I do this, and then what can I do to stop this, and how do I make amends, and, and you go on with your life. I don't know uh, whether there's that kind of concept within the Hindu religion, but I guess it's somewhat the same. It's kind of a glitch. There's something wrong in my balance here, and what do I need to get right, and what do I need to understand, and so forth. But you, Nathan, would probably credit the idea of radical moral failure, and you say, you've got to repent. Right. Now, does that kind of fit? What, uh, does that make sense? And uh, uh, it just doesn't seem to be a category that, uh, that atheists would address very often, from what I've heard through these things. You know? So your, your question is, uh, how, how, from, from your particular perspective, how do you explain radical moral failure? Not how you explain with it, but more how do you deal with it? Uh, how do you deal, yeah, how do you, how do you, how do you respond to it? If you, if you yourself have, have right. done something that is a radical moral, moral failure, what do you do about it? I can say some things about that. Um, you know, from my perspective as an atheist, I would say, you know, it's all about we're social creatures and we need to get along socially, so if there's a problem, just work it out. I, I think from the Christian standpoint, there's this over-focus on sin and Savior. It's all about sin and Savior. And there's a saying that when you're a hammer, all your problems look like nails. So here's the Christian looking for sin everywhere. Sin, sin, sin. Here's the Savior. Everything's sin on the brain. Everything's all about sin. I mean, if I'm an atheist, what am I all about? Truth, science. I'm not, about, I'm not going around looking for sin, 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 sin. Repent, repent, repent. You know, it's just not on my brain saturated like that. Okay, and Ramesh? Yeah, um, so when we talk about moral failures or when we talk about uh, sins, right, they are not a, an exhaustive or an enumerated list, even though we could start by 
talking about you can't steal, you can't um, kill, etc. Uh, but the moral failure should really come from your own understanding of an act and what the effect or influence of that act is. For example, there could be some justified situations where a lie is okay. A white lie may be appropriate. I'm not saying go back and justify every lie you're going to say. But when you can think at that level, rather than think of sins or mistakes as an exhaustive list and every one of them as a corrective action, uh, moral failures occur in those kind of situations. And when they happen, realizing them and anything that you can do to rectify them or going forward is what our faith prescribes. That is what is called as a priyash chitta, which is after the fact, or the after part of that, and what does it mean to me. There are some acts which cannot be taken back. There are some acts for which we can do something to be correct. So it's more of a continuous internal personal feature rather than uh, something that I can do by checking off on two columns in the notebook. Okay, next. Oh, I want Nathan to... Yeah, so just shortly, um, one of the reasons why uh, historically and presently Christians have collaborated to do a lot of good in the world is that we want to spread the love and spread the joy. We're not fixated on sin, 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 sin. But we want to be positively engaged in doing that which we have been made to do. But in another sense, we are doing all of those good works collaborat co collaboratively in the world because of radical moral failure. And, and the scriptures have shown us through repentance and through restoration how to get beyond our sins. When you think of all of the war, like you're very disturbed about war as I am, um, what can we do to end all wars? That is a Christian thought. Uh, it's not an exclusive Christian thought, but it is one that is rooted in radical moral failure. If you don't like the war on Iraq, it's probably because you don't like Albert and corporation and all of this mongering for oil money. Well, that's radical moral, moral failure. It's called greed. And so if we're going to do good in the world, we have to face the black in the world, the dark in the world, the evil in the world. And so there's this two-pronged thing. We want to do good to spread the love and the joy, and we're quite joyful about it. We're full of satisfaction and contentment. But also it's because the Christian has faced the radical moral failure within myself and in the world around me. And there's just no way of getting around that. There's just no way about it. Okay, next. How about Keith? Yeah, I, um, my question is for uh, Bernie. And um, I guess, I, I don't know if we have time to dialogue on this, but um, why would you say, first of all, that religion and belief in God has predominated humanity up until the point, I mean, even now, atheists represent a very small proportion. Most of the world believes in God. Um, if that can be a brief answer, great. If not, I'm going to have to go on. But it's yeah, yeah. to start. Yeah, well, especially in America, atheists are like very small, 3%. But also part of that is uh, when Christianity came to control, they wiped out a whole bunch of atheist writings and stuff. A lot of this stuff has been reconstructed. So there is actually a purging. Uh, there is actually a very ancient... Um, heritage of atheism, you know, way before Christianity, there's schools of philosophy that are atheist. Why are there religions, though? That's the question. I mean, there's a typical atheist answer. I'd be surprised if you didn't give it. Why do atheists typically say that religion exists? Well, it's, before I knew about science, I mean, it's very natural. Yeah, there's thunder and lightning, of course, the gods are angry, and you got Thor, the thunder god, and all these things, and we just ascribe human agency to all these things, and you find out, wait a minute, it's just celestial <laughs> differences, and the earthquake is tectonic plates. It's not an angry God. Yeah. Even Pat Robertson tried to blame the Haiti earthquake on God, and it's like, no, it's just tectonic plates. The answer so, I hear uh, so often is that it's 
because if you, it's basically a survival mechanism. Mm -hmm. Religions sure. are survival mechanisms. Right, right. You agree with that? Yeah, yeah. I know what you're referring That's to. Yeah. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, if religions are survival mechanism, it's because the human gene is made to survive. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Sure. Do you have the human gene? Sure. So your genes are made to survive. Sure. Then if your genes are made to survive, um, <clears throat> How are you going to be? In a, uh, how are you going to guide others to truth? In other words, your genes are not made to discover truth. That's right. That's what you say. Their genes don't. So if it cuts both ways, in your case, if your genes also are not meant to discover truth, you said that your primary motivation is to help others seek truth. Mm -hmm. How are you going to find truth if your genes aren't geared that way? And a couple words you use. This is the time for goodness and justice. How do you know what goodness and justice are as well and truth if your genes are geared only for survival? Okay, so basically we have these powerful brains that have evolved because of the survival of uh, the survival of the, you know the fight for survival. You know, humans against humans, eventually creating atomic power. You know, we have to, and a result of these advanced brains we have, we can now think about logic. And so, and the scientific method is something that we have come up with. Is you know, in the human history, it's very recent. And since we've applied more and more science, our technology has you know, exponentially grown. So this is just the power of using our brain. It's a discovery we made. Why do we like science? I can't answer my question. My question is, why is your brain, why is your brain able to discover those truths if it's geared for survival and not for discovering truth? That's my question. It's, it's a side effect of a complex brain. So they can be equally right, though, in, in this case, then. They, they could be. The reason why science is superior is because of history. We've seen how it wins. In fact, over time, it's blowing away all these religious ideas, you know? God made man. Oh, wait a minute. It's well, evolution. It's still yeah, not blowing them away. Well, I'm saying all these, there's been, instead of scientific explanations for things, there's been religious explanations. And science has been blowing away the religious explanations one by one. And like evolution is the latest battle. You know, Christians by, are still fighting evolution, you know, the creation-evolution debate. You know, evolution is a scientific fact. But you do confess your genes aren't here to find truth. The brain, uh, the genes compose things like the brain, and the brain has thinking processes, and these, this brain is complex enough to know somebody came up with a scientific method and, and revised it over time, and we see the results of that winning. And that's why we say, let's put our trust in it. If we didn't have the results of science, there's no reason to trust it. But we trust science because of all the powerful results it's brought us. Okay, we'll, yeah, okay. we need to, I think it's almost 7.30, so we're, wow. going, to, we're going to have uh, one more question. And then um, did, we're going to have, a, I think we'll give a, each of the presenters a chance to sort of summarize. And um, although uh, you may not have had your question completely answered, I'm sure each of these three men and everybody else will be glad to hang around and answer some more questions. So uh, did I see your hand up, Gavin? Yeah. Okay, okay we're, gonna give, we're gonna give Gavin the last one. Go ahead, Gavin. I was going to defer to the others, but now I guess I'll... <laughs> well, I've been, I've been calling on all these people, and it seems like I've called more on Christians than on atheists, so I wanted, I wanted to give it, uh, someone I know as an atheist a chance to make... To reply to Keith's question, um, I would say that maybe we have evolved the ability to discern truth in the sense that what you're saying about survival. Well, if we learn what truth is, it can help us to be better survivors. So those that respond a certain way to what truth is, they're going to pass on that tendency, and they're going to offspring are going to survive. It. And did you have a question you wanted to address to the panel, Gavin? Oh, that was that was that was, that was it. You can use the rest of the time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay, um, each of you, um, let's show we continue in the same order we did before, Bernie, okay, and then uh, Nathan, then Ramesh. How much do we have? One minute. Uh, that's, yeah, let me give you each, uh, I'll give you a minute and a half. Okay, well, well one thing I wanted to bring up was the, the motivation for why we do good. Um, you know, for people in America, we have like three, over about 315 million people in America, so in a high percentage of those are Christians, and they think in terms of heaven and hell and Jesus, and this is a big motivation for why you do good things. But, you know, there's like three times that in India that are Hindu, there's over a billion. So instead of 315 million, there's a billion people in India, and they're, they're not thinking about resurrection at all. They're thinking about reincarnation and karma. So they have a different motivation. So, you know, the thing I want to leave you with 
are you a product of this place that you've grown up with? Are you just, do you think of terms of heaven and hell because you're an American? Or in terms of karma because you came from India? Or can you overcome these cognitive biases that you were born with and use logic and reason and say, let's look at the whole landscape here and figure out which makes the most sense? Um, so that's what I would encourage you to do is to sit back and evaluate your own standing and, and look at in scope of the whole world. Okay, so. Nathan? Well, the, the Christian Bible says there is no one good but God. And so the Christian gospel is that if we want to be part of the stream of good in this world, we need to be united to God. Uh, this is why the Son of God incarnate, Jesus Christ, came into this world not only just to show us the pathway of good, but to lay down his life, dying on the cross, to satisfy God's justice against all of our ungoodness. Now, this is the Christian gospel, that God has, in a very good way, reconciled us to himself and to his pattern of good in the world. And so this is the Christian message. Uh, the prophet Isaiah says in the Jewish scriptures, all of our human righteousness, all together, some total, is a pile of filthiness. And so it is that if we want to be cleansed from all unrighteousness, we must do what the gospel calls us to do. And that is to put our faith in Jesus Christ. And his righteousness becomes our righteousness. Why do we do good? Out of utter gratitude for God's great gift to us, that he has allowed us, though we're filthy, filthy in every respect, we even fail to do what is good, not just doing the wrong. God has wiped our slate clean because of his love for Jesus. And if, we, if you're united to faith, by faith, if you're united to Jesus, then you become part of this stream that starts as a trickle and then becomes this great flowing river that the uh, prophet Ezekiel uh, talks about that wipes away the filth and brings all the teeming life, all of, that, all of the fish life and plant life in the river. All of this good for the nations comes. It gets stronger and stronger. You can make the pathway even stronger, this great stream, if you would put your faith in Jesus and join those of us who are not trying to do our own good, but to do the good of God. Ramesh? Feels good to have the last word. <laughs> <laughs> In my mind, listening to all the interactions and also the opinions of uh, both Bernie and uh, Pastor Nathan, irrespective of what you believe in, irrespective of what your faith or your scriptures or your teachers tell you, irrespective of what are the reasons for which you are involved in or your actions are, irrespective of what result you want to get out of that, irrespective of why it has happened, if we can all get over one simple theme in our own lives, which is to try and act in a way that's beneficial or that benefits more people than just me or my individual self, I think it's going to do the community a lot better. It's going to do the city, the state, the country, or the world a lot better. This is a common theme, a common message that I hear from all these different faiths and beliefs. I think that's what I want to get across to you to leave behind your individual egoistic existence. Think, look and work for people around you, the communities around you, the world around you. It obviously has to be a better world to live. Well, thank you very much all three of you um, and thank you audience for all your questions. I noticed there were a lot of hands held up at the end. And so because of that, I expect everybody that had their hand up, I expect you to come down here and interact with these people after, the, after we're through. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
like I have one word of thanks to both Bernie and Chris and Nathan. This is the first time that I'm being involved in this kind of a discussion. And I think I learned a lot more than what I was able to share. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.